Welcome back to another episode of Trading Secrets. Today, we are joined for the second time by reality TV personality and entrepreneur, Kyle Cook. We last spoke with Kyle two years ago about his sparkling hard teas and canned cocktails company, Loverboy, in addition to his experience being on Bravo's hit show, Summer House. More recently, Kyle has been in the news for some recent drama regarding his friend and Summer House co-star Craig Conover partnering with a competing brand of Loverboy. We are going to discuss all the behind the scenes of what went down between the two of them, how he expects his business to be impacted, and where the two of them go from here. Kyle, thank you so much for being back for the second time on Trading Secrets almost two years later. My pleasure. All right, let's give people context too, because that intro had to have some serious changes in the last 48 hours. Right. I, I called you, what, it was about a month ago, yeah. or I sent you a message. I was like, man, it's been two years since we've talked about Loverboy, and I'm hearing some things online, and this is a great place where pop culture meets finance. Let's talk about the facts of the company, right? Because you've talked about deficits and stuff. Then all of a sudden, this stuff comes up. Mm-hmm. So unfortunately, <laughs> as long as you're willing to do it, let's at least step into the the business facts and not as much as the gossip. Yeah, no, that's, that's my MO, and I figured what better place to do it. You know, I've been, people have been wondering, am I going to, am I going to comment? Am I going to reply? You know, quite frankly, there's a side of me that just wanted to let it fade away, but there's so many different things I feel like need to be corrected. Yeah. That I'm happy to. Okay. Let's correct them and we'll talk business. And I'm going to have, I have my notes here because I'm trying to take the emotion and the feelings out of it. That's what wound me up you know, wound up getting me in trouble in the first place. So Yeah. And I think, I mean, we'll get into the numbers. You know them better than me, but coming into this, I looked, you know, the canned alcohol beverage business, right? Over $14 billion market cap. Huge. It looked in 2022. And I think what's interesting is it's, it's, it's fascinating how TV and especially small, uh, smaller communities in very niche areas can make it seem like there are only two canned cocktails in the world. That's obviously not the case when you're right. looking at a fourteen billion dollar market. So we'll talk about the business, but here's what I want to get you into. Got it. Watch what happens live. I had never watched an episode of Watch What Happens Live until I went on as a bartender to promote my book about right. a month ago. That was recent, yeah. Yeah, I could not believe that show. It is like, if you imagine the hardest like Us Weekly or people interview you get, it's 30 minutes, full blitz, no fluff, boom, boom, boom. It's like click a blink of an eye, too. Yeah, you and don't even remember what you say. No. I mean, I was sitting there, and all of a sudden, he's like, so, Jason, um, we, we heard about your, and it wasn't even like a hello. It's like, we heard about your ex, and she's rather shave her eyebrows off than be with you. What do you think about it? I'm like, holy shit. Hi, Mom. You're in the audience. I know you're happy. Yeah. So it comes in hot. So like, I wanna, How about the book, though? Yeah, how about <laughs> the book? That's why I'm here. So I want to give that, like, for someone who's very removed from it, but was in it to a certain level at a distance, it's hot, it's heavy, it's hard to manage that. Yeah. I want to address the conflict between the lover boy and the, the competitor spread society with what happened on watch what happens live. What would you say regarding that entire situation that just unfolded? Yeah. So, I mean, as you can relate, um, you're in the hot seat and the one thing I've learned is I've been on there over 15 times is like, you can't not answer yeah. like that just does not fly. You, you won't be asked back if you don't answer his questions. And I'll be honest, like he caught me off guard, Andy Cohen. Like, like I was ready to talk about summer house and I hadn't thought about this in a while. And, um, I let my emotions get the best of me. And in that moment, you can actually like Andy sees that he sees that I'm hurt. And what does he do? He digs deeper. Yeah. And, you know, up until then I had very consciously decided not to comment, um, via the various press requests about Craig's involvement in this competitor. I was very much focused on keeping this a private matter um, until I made it very public on Watch What Happens. And um, that was not my intention. You know, what what, what said was said, but, you know, I'm friends with Paige. I'm friends with Craig. I, you know, last thing I'm trying to do is make it awkward for for any of us. Okay. So... I want to get into some of the investor talk that happened there, but right. you know, you look back at the interview and when you watch it, is there anything or what specifically would you have said differently or what yeah, would I mean, you have look, not like I, on? I think from a choice of words perspective, I wish I wasn't so reactionary. Okay. You know, at the end of the day, I don't really think anything I said was, was not true, but I, I could have handled it better. And, yeah. and like, I think that's a, <laughs> uh, a, a constant theme in my life on camera. You know, sometimes <laughs> I'm right, but it's my delivery 
and it's my tone and my temper that make me dead wrong. Yeah. And like, I wish I could say I was a faster learner. Yeah. But okay. <laughs> well, here we are. We're all, we're all getting there day yeah. by day. Uh, and it's wild how all these, there's so many small circles, right? Like I've done business with Ben and Claudia, they're friends. I've done business with you and Amanda. You guys are friends. We're sitting literally in, in, in Hannah and Paige's I know. Like, I recognize these wood studio. slats. So, I recognize these wood slats. There's a lot of moving parts here. It's a small so world. It's a good perspective and a good change to actually get into the business. So there was obviously a lot of investor talk. Let's talk right. about it. There's been well, a lot funny, of talk. Like I, Who are the investors? Like, what's the investor situation? Let's break the business down to the investor pool and what it looks like. Right. So- I mean, I don't know what got lost in translation because it wasn't, I mean, if what I said on Watch What Happens just had, you know, um, if it stopped there, that'd be one thing. But obviously there's a lot that unfolded on podcasts since, and I don't know what got lost in translation. But as we talked about two years ago, as I very publicly filmed and talked about, um, Loverboy has investors. We've had investors since 2019. I value them immensely. I've had lots of them texting me saying, what in the heck is going on? Um, you know, I could not have done it without them. And um, from an ownership standpoint, I give all of my employees, all of my consultants, all of my partners in the business equity in the company. So no, I am not a sole owner. You know, I, I want to make that very clear. Like we, we were actually fundraising. I was very vocal about this with my close friends, Craig included, during Winter House 2. I was busy raising a round of financing. It's like, this is not a secret. Yeah. Okay. So two years ago, you had made a statement that you wanted to build it from scratch. You raised, before you went to friends and family to raise capital. Right. And you said you owned 100% of it. And on this show, you said you put in about 100K of your own, own right. money to get it up and running. Once you went out to friends and family, how much did you raise at that point? Yeah. So, and, and again, this kind of points to the stress of running a company. Um, you get a lot of people, you know, counting on you and wanting this thing to be successful. So for the first year, from 2018 to 2019, I funded the business. That's about that 100,000 okay. bucks. That, that was, you know, Amanda was working a full-time job, so it was, she wasn't even in a position to do all the design work. I had to hire a design agency, and then she provided the cre creative direction. I had to- Because she, last time, and sorry to interrupt, but I just want to make clear, before she started working with you, you had said last uh, podcast two years ago, she was working full-time in corporate world exactly. and filming, correct? Yeah, which like, I probably said it back then, but I'm so proud of, I mean, I don't know of anybody that's gone three, four years on TV while working a corporate gig, like well, a nine to five desk job. You had, And what else are you at? Because I listened to the podcast back, of course. You also actually said that at some point when she was unwinding, you had called her lazy. But in the podcast on Trading Secrets, you had said that that is one of the biggest regrets you've ever And it still had. is. It still yeah. haunts me. It still yeah. haunts her. You know, as you'll see actually on this, this coming Summer House reunion, you know, there's a lot more to it. I don't think I understood some of the things that she struggles with when I call her that. Yeah. And at the end of the day, regardless of any like mental health struggles, like most people want to come home from work and not work. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wired differently. <laughs> and so look, like this was, you know, still in the kind of early stages of our relationship, all things considered. And, um, and yeah, you know, that hundred K not only provided, you know, some capital to, you know, help with, some of the design and, and packaging grunt work, but it was the samples and cans that I got onto the show season three to get my friends to try it. It's legal. It's it's all this stuff. But fast forward a year in 2019, season four, we launched the damn thing. Now, what did it take to, to launch? Mm -hmm. I was told in beverage that you want to raise at least a million dollars. And I was like, a million, like from friends and family, like I'll maybe get five grand out of my parents. <laughs> yeah. Like where's the rest Good come luck. from? And so, you know, but beverage is really, really um, capital intensive. So much to my surprise, I filled it in a month. Damn. And actually, I oversubscribed the friends and family round. I actually raised almost $1.3 million. Wow. And I was like, all right, fine. I got a little buffer from what was recommended. And, um, you know, from there, we actually did kind of the unthinkable in food and beverage. We were profitable for our, thir our first three years. Um, most brands are losing... Five, ten, fifteen million dollars, if you can believe it or not, totally. if they're at a national scale at our level. Yep. And they've had to raise 30, 40, 50 million to do that. Sure. So we 
we're kind of a, an outlier and I'm really proud of like what we've been able to do. It's pretty impressive. Um, and we'll talk about the deficit, but obviously that comes with, a you know, you're competing against some of the biggest people in the world, like, you know, AB, uh, you know, AB oh, yeah. InBev, like all those players. We'll get into that. But, uh, and we'll also talk a little bit about Craig's uh, involvement here on the investment side. But what I want to get into is you had mentioned last time on the podcast that you had 17 to 18 employees. Um, you mentioned that contractors, employees have equity. Mm -hmm. Also last podcast, I think you had mentioned that um, your wife didn't have equity and there was a play to possibly gift her equity because there wouldn't be tax liability associated with it. Um, what's the update on that, given the fact that you said employees do have equity? Yeah. I mean, look, like um, like any company, if you're only here for a couple months, you're not going to vest the options, not to get too, too technical. Yep. But most startups, if they are offering full comp packages that include equity, um, that equity vests over four years and there's a one-year cliff, meaning if you leave before one year, you don't get anything. Mm -hmm. We took the literal template for startup full comp packages that include equity and gave that to everybody. Um, and as for Amanda, yeah, I was all set to give her equity. I think it was like when she joined, um, I think it was like when she kind of became full-time sometime in 2020. And I looked into it and I'm like, hey, we were already engaged. We're supposed to get married. And it was, there's a, a ton of tax benefits if I just waited. Yeah. And so that's exactly what we're doing. I actually had my, my legal team finally draft up everything like eight months ago. Um, and so that, you know, that was a, a, essentially a benefit that you get being able to gift your spouse unlimited amounts of assets tax-free. Okay. So I, I, that took me about a year to figure out. Okay. So, <laughs> so there, then there's a misconception. You don't own 100% of it. No. Contractors, investors have a piece of it. If You've Carl's a got a piece, it. like, okay. yeah, this is, like, I could not do this by myself. Okay. All right. So then enters in this whole Craig drama, right? right. So, so there's comments out there that Craig expressed interest to be involved. Um, you said, I believe, that that wasn't the case. Was Craig involved? Did Craig want to be involved? Did you give Craig the opportunity to be involved as an investor? And even looking back on it, when you take a step back, whether Craig's involved or not, does that really influence things for you? Like, what does that mean to you? No, I mean, look, um, first and foremost, all my friends that I filmed with know that I've raised money. Mm -hmm. The only person that ever expressed interest was Carl. I never pushed this on anyone because... In a filming environment, I want people drinking Loverboy because they want to drink Loverboy, not because they're an investor, not because they're my friend, because it tastes great. Sure. Now, granted, I hope they respect what I've done. Yeah. But um, I never pushed this on anybody, Craig included. And Craig, to answer your question, Craig never expressed interest. He never once asked to invest in Loverboy. And, um, you know, I, I guess I'll address specifically what was said on another podcast. Um, the way it all kind of unfolded, in early February, Craig and I got drinks. He was coming to town. He made a point of reaching out. I thought it was just to catch up. Okay. And it wasn't up until like the last 10 minutes before our friends got there. It was actually Schwartz was in town. He was filming Watch What Happened, so we were just killing time. It wasn't until like Schwartz was 10 minutes away that Craig kind of sprung this, this you know, collaboration on me. And I was just trying to process it, quite frankly. And, and then boom. Our friends are there. Um, and and it, it sounded very much like, you know, the offer on the table was, you know, he was being given equity. And um, and then boom, like then, like he actually left early and that was it. And so the next day I texted him, I'm like, hey man, I can't, I, I've been given a lot of thought to, you know, what you said about this this opportunity you have. And please like hold off from signing anything. You know, I'd love to put an offer on the table to kind of counter it. And the irony is I had actually talked to him a, a month prior to this because we're coming out with a THC uh, soda, which would be a completely different opportunity. So I'm like, sure. all right, well, let's just talk about the full package then. Sure. You know, and, and again, not to get too into the weeds, yeah. but after a back and forth, Craig essentially said it was too late. And that was that. And was I disappointed? Absolutely. Like, here's a good friend of mine, you know, and I just figured he'd at least give me an opportunity to like hear me out. And, um, 
and yeah, you know, I, to be honest, I kind of feared that this was impact our friendship because, you know, this has been my blood, sweat, and tears for the last five years. And, um, you know, maybe, you know, call me a sensitive guy, call me to, you know, the industry's too big to be concerned. Do I really need Craig involved? No, but I just didn't think one of my good friends would go hop in bed with a competitor. And so, um, you know, that's it. That's, that was the extent of our conversation. So in the perfect scenario though, what would it have looked like that Craig came back to you to benchmark the offer to give you a last look? Like if you had to paint the perfect scenario, Craig's at the table right. here, Craig, this is what ideally I would have liked to happen. Given the fact that you got to do your thing, you got to go make money, you got to invest in businesses. I have consideration for that. This is what I would have liked exactly. to happen. But what would you have liked to have happen? Well, what I've liked, what I would have liked to happen happen was what was said on a podcast. Somewhere on the lines, someone said, um, you know, Craig gave me the opportunity to reconsider because I had not given him opportunity to invest in Loverboy, which is not true. He just never asked. I would have loved for him to do exactly that. Hey, before I go down this path, like you said, I'll, I'll hold up from signing. Let me hear you out. And let's just have, you know, a business to business chat. That just never happened. Interesting. Okay. So let's, I'm going to play the role of Craig for a second. So I'm Craig. I got sewing down South. Um, I'm, I'm, I got podcasts. I'm, I'm doing well with the show, making money off social media. I want to diversify into the beverage space. And my friend, it's my really good friend. He's never even approached me. I never even thought about it. So when another friend approached me, I was like, all right, sure, let's do it. It helps me hedge and diversify my portfolio. And it's kind of cool. Who knows what it will go? What's your response to Craig if that's what he says to you? Like Craig, Kyle didn't reach out to me. Like I didn't, like I was just, you know, sure. I'll do a, I'll do, I'll do a deal just like, you know, another friend gets approached by White Claw to get a hundred thousand dollar paid deal. And well, that's like, not ah, what this was. Yeah. This but is, I'm, I'm just this trying is ownership to think. on a silver platter. And again, like I thought we were good friends and I thought he could kind of see firsthand because I've known him since 2018 yeah. when I started this, how much of a freaking grind it is. Yeah. How hard it is to break through the level of effort. Like I don't I don't have business partners that run Loverboy when I'm filming and and on the road doing meet and greets. I have all this stress, all this burden, that's on me. Mm -hmm. And he knows that. And yeah. I just kind of I would have liked to think. And again, maybe this is just wishful thinking that there was at least an opportunity for him to hear me out before he went down this other path. Okay. Got it. Now, in there's conversation about that there was a dinner. I think you and Ben went to dinner, right? So he right. is the founder and owner of the competitor. Um, and uh, my understanding too is that you like Ben also wanted to uh, uh, like kind of do like more collaboration stuff with Loverboy as opposed to like competition stuff. Is that the case? Did you go to dinner? What's yeah? The so truth I mean, look there again. This got twisted. Um, I wasn't like begging him to come to dinner to me. Yeah, with me. Um. He had DM me when we were both at an industry conference in January. And, and like per the timeline his wife laid out, like he was already in talks with Craig. I didn't see it. I was actually leaving the conference early. I bumped into him on the way out. He introduced himself and then suggested we like grab dinner in the city. I said, sure. Um, responded to his DM. We exchanged numbers. We set up the dinner. This dinner ended up taking place about two weeks before Craig and I got drinks. Okay. So I think um, since like, we're talking like receipts and timelines these days, <laughs> uh, the dinner was February 7th. Okay. I really enjoyed the conversation. I, it's not often I get to sit down with a fellow entrepreneur in the same exact space where we are, you know, in the trenches um, fighting the big guys. And, um, you know, it got to a point where like, yeah, he was – Hey, maybe we could collab and like throw a party, kind of cross pollinate our audiences. Sure. And, you know, fast forward the next day, I see he's with Craig. Um, and he never mentioned that, which is, which is fine. I didn't know at this time that him and Craig were talking about a collab. But do you, I wonder, do you think he had any idea that? Well, yeah, Craig I mean, he, he knows Craig and I are friends. And I just, yeah. what, what I just should, should have said on, Watch what happens instead of using the words that I did, which I think I, I used the word shady. If Ben was spending like three hours with me and three hours with Craig in a 24-hour period, mm -hmm. 
He didn't tell me that he was talking to Craig and he didn't tell Craig he had dinner with me. Okay. And I just found that odd. And I just wish he was a little more transparent with his intentions instead of like a, it kind of felt like when they announced it, it was like supposed to be like this, I got gotcha you moment. Yeah. And maybe that's me reading between the lines. You know, again, I, I put everything into this and mm -hmm. I'm super passionate about my business. And so, you know, maybe I overreacted or, yeah. or I'm like, too dramatic, I, you know, I don't know. But like at yeah. the end of the day, um, yeah, I just found it extremely odd that he wouldn't mention hanging out with either one of us. Yeah, let me, let me, let's, let me ask you this. So business, to, uh, entrepreneur to entrepreneur, you know, business case to business case. Let's go to the very top. Let's go to like a Bill Gates and a Steve Jobs, right? Like those guys had a lot of respect for each other, clearly competing. And I think when each of them made moves, they're kind of like, fuck hats off. Like in the game of business, I don't know if him saying, hey, I want exposure to Bravo and then picking Craig as an opportunity. It, is that more of just like a business strategy play than well, like clearly, yeah, he's trying thing, to, right? He's, like, they're trying to build their brands yeah. they, and they need to go tap a different audience. Yeah. I guess my point is even in those fierce comp like competitive worlds, yeah. like I know plenty of people in this space. I purposely don't poach employees from brands where I'm friendly with the founders. There's a level of respect because guess what? This is an extremely, extremely yeah. small industry. Yeah, yeah. And so there's just like certain lines, you, you know, you yeah. try to avoid. And if you're going to cross them, just be honest and transparent about it. And so, yeah. look, at the end of the day, like, um, I, I think that it's really not about us versus them. You know, we... It's really like David versus Goliath. Right, right. Because we're a $14 billion industry. Yeah. And, yeah. and probably more so at this point because that number's old. Yeah, um, that, was, that was a 2022 number. Right. I think it's almost double. So, you know, I, I guess that's where I'm I'm pretty bummed about how everything went down. Yeah. Just because that was never my intent. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm focused on you know, trying to fend off competition from massive, massive conglomerates that have endless amounts of resources. Like a lot of people don't know, because like whether you want to say my competition's hard seltzer or spirit-based RTDs or canned cocktails, like a lot of people don't know where these big brands come from. Mm -hmm. White Claw is owned by Mike's Hard Lemonade. Of course. Truly and Twisted are the same, you know, parent company, Boston Beer. They're publicly traded, you know, $10 billion company. A lot of people like think Barstool owns High Noon. It's actually owned by the Gallo yeah, family. Yeah. The Gallo family's been around for a hundred years. Ever. They they are the world's biggest wine producer. Yeah, like High Noon was like a little pet They're project, a little like Constellation Brands. Yeah. Like, I mean, these are just like yeah, little like, baby people don't things in their just, portfolio. And that, that, that's why, like, I really think it's kind of unfortunate that we weren't in a position to work better together because it's we small companies need to create like a rising tide to fight the big guys because the big guys can just outspend all of us. They have thousands of employees and alcohol is logistically challenging. There's regulatory, yeah. you know, things to take into consideration. And so it's just not startup friendly. Like I've worked in healthcare, real estate, finance, tech, yeah. nothing compares to this industry. Yeah. But I'm, I'm trying to understand. So you got to, we got to, $30 billion industry, okay? And now you're expanding. You obviously have teas, which don't compare, compete. And now you're going with the THC uh, soda. It's a THC Yeah, we're doing soda. zero sugar. Okay, so you're diversifying the portfolio. Oh, yeah. It's like poppy meets THC. Yeah. So, meets here's, awesome. so here's my, my question to you is like, when you see this big picture and the, the, the strategy of exiting, which is what you talked about two years ago, I don't mean to um, take a shot here at Craig, but how much is Craig impacting numbers when you're looking at the long game, whether he goes with you or whether he goes with the competitor in the, a space the, in which yeah. you have different, even products at some case? Like, is this really a business issue at any standpoint? Look, look, at the end of the day, this is more about our friendship, if yeah, I can be honest. Yeah, that's what it feels like, because it doesn't yeah. like it's going to move And that's why needle. I really hate, and like I'm beating myself up for letting my emotions get the best of me. Um, I was just committed to just kind of like pushing forward and, you know, chalking it up as like a miscommunication or a missed opportunity, or maybe he was just too far down the path with this, with, with, you know, with this team to kind of course correct. Um, no, I mean, like, look, like I said, I'm focused on basically 
trying to keep up with the guys that have tons of resources. Yeah. Like, you know, a, a lot of people don't understand how easy it is for the big guys to create a really crappy product, but get exponentially more distribution overnight. Mm -hmm. And um, in alcohol, it's not, it's like the quality of the product almost is not, like out of sight, out of mind. It's like, how cheap can we make this? And how wide can we go to push out the competition, to push out the small guys? Um, and so, I mean, look, I, 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 in all seriousness, if I, you know, I, I hope to have a chance to talk with Craig, you know, I want to squash the beef. Yeah. Like what's done is done. Like I, I tell him straight up, like, I'm sorry for being reactionary and watch what yeah. happens. Like, um, you know, the irony here is it's, it's really not about two startups competing against one another. It's trying to stay relevant in an industry that is really good at keeping yeah. the startups small. Yeah. Cause it feels like, yeah, the business case here feels like if you put on the Kyle cook, like grind entrepreneurial mindset and you just throw those emotions to the side for a minute, I feel like there's so much good that can come from this, right? Okay. Craig can go with the competitor. Uh, maybe you can start to work with Bravo and put like a non circumvent in place. Like, Hey, I bring a lot of value here. We can't have competitors working with people on the show. Like there's ways to like strategize to avoid this. And in a world that this competitor and with Ben's company and you and your competitor, you guys can continue to like push your markets, build your brands and somehow even get over this Craig thing create a mutual understanding and put this all behind you and both grow. Yeah, I mean, like, like in all seriousness, the business like, we, case, it seems like it's yeah, an easy fix. We have a lot more com in common than, than, than you'd think. You know, I know that they know firsthand how stressful it is yeah. financially. We're dealing with the same stuff. Like I said, most, most beverage companies, particularly ALK, are either losing money up until they get acquired or mm -hmm. they just run out of money and they go belly up. Yeah. In fact, I, a lot of, I started Loverboy several years before Ben started his company. A lot of the companies that started around where I did 2018, 2019, 2020, like that vintage where they're heavily venture backed. Yeah. They are out of business. Yeah. Because if you were so reliant on investors the, in this new high interest rate era, capital you can't raise capital. You're done. You're done. You're done. Yeah. So more often than not, the small guys that I used to be at the industry conferences on sharing a stage, yeah. again, as competitors, but in this together, they are disappearing. Yeah. Like, bye-bye. Yeah. I know there's a lot of people out there that are talking about that, the gossip side of this. And that's why I wanted to bring up that last point I brought up. Because this feels like, of course, it's a friendship to you. And it's near and dear to your heart. This does feel more gossip than an actual business case that is having massive ripple effects. Because, you, because it does feel like there really won't be much movement in, as in regards to numbers as it relates to this specific scenario. I think you agree with that. So then let's go to the friendship part. Obviously, it's a big part of your show and a part of your livelihood too. Uh, where, like Craig, I said, I think you said you wanted to squash it with him, but like, where does it go? Do you just say, okay, hey, I understand you have ownership there. Let's put it behind us. How, how do you, I mean, how do yeah, you overcome the, it? How I mean, overcome? at the end of the day, now that's the only choice. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It, it became a very binary outcome. Yeah. I'm not going to let this hopefully interfere with our friendship. I think that, um, you know, I just wish the friendship was taken into a little more consideration or maybe I have a different interpretation of what our friendship is. I, I, yeah. I don't know. All right. Let's just talk about this. Obviously we're talking about competition in general. How does the competitor landscape you've already alluded to a little bit, right? but how does it, how does it keep you up at night when you look at the deficit that you've talked about on the show, the 1.5 million, has competitors played a big part of that, which is why you're triggered by this? Talk to me about your overall vision of the competitor landscape as it connects to this specific situation. From a competition standpoint, I know, and this is why I buy all my competitors' products, I know that we can use better quality ingredients to make a better tasting, better for you liquid, as we say in the industry. What keeps me up at night is the big guys can make cheaper alternatives, but push it out faster and basically demand the attention of our wholesalers and retailers. Right. Because we're all fighting for the same spot on the shelf. It's just distribution. Yeah, it's yeah. distribution, um, you know, and just the manpower it takes to stay top of mind with our wholesalers and retailers is colossal. Like we're not even close to having a big enough team based on how big our distribution network is. That's 
Like the competition yeah. can always demand their attention better than me because they're way, way bigger. 100%. That's what keeps me up. Let's talk about this then. So people that watch the show, that are listening to this, that can somewhat connect to it, because we're not going to get into statement of cash flows and balance sheet and everything else, but <laughs> let's get into stuff that they can understand, right? Sure. You put 100K of your money into it. You have a $3 million loss. Um, talk to me about personally, like w was the company ever at a point in which like there was a burden rate you saw the uh, end, like it, it was going to possibly go out of business? And if so... For the people that are listening to this that only see two seconds on the show, what type of impact does it have? How much do you lose? Do you have an SBA structure in place where you have a guarantee with the bank? Like, right. What does it mean to you with the numbers that are happening when you have a $3 million loss, given what you've put in and what you've raised, so that people back home that don't know all the intricacies can have a connection to the stress you're enduring? So I, I, I think this is why entrepreneurship, um, it sounds sexy, and it sounds cool because you're independent, you're, you're your own boss, but like when all of a sudden you're dealing with a complex industry and a complex business model, I don't care how hot your brand is. Like in 2020, we almost went out of business twice. Why? Because the pandemic slowed down our production. So we put all this cash to running these big production runs of, of our sparkling hard teas. That's the only thing we were selling back then. Actually, no, we launched our TDs too. Um, that's when we launched our Sprit. So we had all this cash going out. Yeah. And then because there were delays and because our distributors were delayed because um, they're dealing with their own cash flow problems, it was taking longer to get paid. It was longer. It was taking longer to recoup our investment. So on two different occasions, one of our investors gave us a, a quarter million dollar line of credit that allowed us to keep the lights on. Because was there a point your current ratio? I'll explain what a current ratio is in the recap. Your current ratio was below one. It's so where your current liabilities were greater than your current. Um, uh, yeah, assets. I mean back then we like keep in mind we'd only raised about a million three. Okay, and so like just for, strictly from a cash flow cycle, um, yeah, things were out of whack. Wow. And so, I mean, that's a perfect example of why these inventory based businesses are. I mean. A nightmare. I remember back in the day when I was at Bird Dogs, we were on Shark Tank. I couldn't film because of my contract, but um, we ramped up production thinking it was going to be amazing. And uh, my friends kind of made buffoons of themselves and it wasn't a very good day from a sales perspective. And that alone almost put the business out, wow. out of business. Wow. So yeah. it's, and that was 2020. I mean, here it is 2024. So, I mean, just dealing with the constant ebbs and flows of like cash coming in, cash coming out and the need to staff up because you've expanded. Um, it doesn't matter how good your product is, like particularly in alcohol. Once you launch, you're like, you're only that shiny new toy in a wholesale or retailer's portfolio once. Yeah. And then you need, I mean, honestly, what fans can do and our customers can do is continue to ask for Loverboy. If, if there's, if you go to a store that no longer, long, no longer has Loverboy because mm -hmm. there's been a, onslaught of competition from the big guys mm -hmm. just keep asking for it yeah you know it's it's little things like that um but yeah i mean you know every day is uh it's a new challenge so i want to put that in perspective for people back home that don't own a business essentially just imagine your mom or dad keeps giving you money and money and money and you keep spending it and spending it and spending it and your mom and dad are like, what, where the hell's happening? And you're like, trust me, it'll work out. It'll work out. <laughs> and you keep spending and spending and spending and you don't have any more. And then you're filming a TV show and your friends and your relationships and all these people are putting pressure on you. You're continuing to run this deficit on money that's being handed to you to perform. And so the stress of that is massive, especially when you have employees that are relying on yeah, paychecks. If so, I was a sole owner yeah. and it was just me. You wouldn't be all rattled the way. And you I didn't are. have, yeah. you know, 10,000 retailers, 180 wholesalers and 30 employees. Like, my God, that, yeah. that would be amazing. That'd be amazing. So I'm just trying to give perspective to people that don't <laughs> have it, how intense it could be. Uh, that's a good transition. We're talking personally. There's rumors out there that there was also personal debt, which, of course, is much different than any type of investment into the company or SBA right. lending. What type of personal debt do you have? Or is that true or false? Yeah, I'm not sure why personal loans was brought up in a podcast. Like, I'm not really sure why a lot of things were, but at the end of the day, no, I do not have a personal loan. The way it works, because we are profitable, which again, unusual beverage, so I don't expect other people in this space to understand how we did this. We qualified for a small business loan. It's, it's backed by the government. 
It's called an SBA loan. And um, it's, it's usually, you know, easier to secure that type of loan when you have a heavy asset business like real estate mm -hmm. or, you know, machinery or stuff like that. Um, so we qualified for an SBA loan when I was filming Winter House One. I remember like jumping up and down. How much was the loan for? 4.2 million. You, that is huge. Yeah. So the max you can do is five. So we we put together a very compelling business case why a, a community bank backed by the government would, would lend us $4.2 million. Um, and a big part of that was we were profitable, wildly that, that profitable. Deal got, that deal got approved. Yeah. I want to give people perspective, SBA loans, right? So this is what's funded literally the entire small business initiative in America. Yeah. Think about like a Chobani yogurt. You see it everywhere. It crushes it. They started with like a $100,000 SBA loan. Yeah. So it's a way to take a high risk business and have the government back it because we need small businesses to run the country. A $4.2 million SBA loan for anyone that's listening is asinine. I worked in SBA underwriting, right? I used to underwrite these deals. No one gets a 4.2 million. So that is a, that is a <laughs> testament to where the company was at. That's unheard of. Right. And so, yeah, when you can raise 4.2 million at 6% over 10 years, Huge. you're not going to VCs. No. That would be the least savvy thing to do as an entrepreneur and founder you could imagine, right? And so it's basically the equivalent of free money versus giving away a huge stake in your, in your business to a, to an investor. So we qualified for that loan. And the way SBA loans work, like you said, it's what's, what's literally made the US so founder and entrepreneur friendly. It's the SBA program. And um, it requires every single person that qualifies for their business to personally guarantee it. So, and that's the daunting thing. You saw, I don't know that's if you remember. That's a different stress level for right. everyone so, listening. That's a lot. So here's the scoop. In a, in, a, in a world where you have a business loan that you don't have a personal guarantee, if your business goes out of business, your business goes bankrupt, it's handled in court, they try to sell off the assets, you you're, you kind of wash your hands and then you you know you start over. In it, I think SBA loans, the easiest comparison would be like student loans. Mm -hmm. You're never getting away from that debt no matter what happens to your business, what happens to your career. And so when I was... Uh, filming season six and I slap my hand on the table and I'm like, I'm dealing with a little sub more substantial, you know what? It, you know, we were again dealing with some of the stress that I've talked about today. And now it feels like the stakes are higher than the prior, previous year, season five, because I got this SBA loan where I had to personally guarantee it. And um, so you all, and just for everyone back at home, if you don't know what personal guarantee is, what that means is essentially every asset you have that exists under your name, it can go immediately to the bank and the SBA if you cannot repay this loan. So your home, your jewelry, your, your cars, anything that you have, that essentially the government and the bank can come take it, repo it, and you're pretty much life's over if you don't right. repay that, which is a whole and the different funny thing added is, stress. But, but, but. When you're a founder applying for an SBA loan, there's a good chance you've already put all of your assets into the business. Correct. And you're like, so what? What do I have to lose? What do I have to lose? And um, that's where you run into trouble. <laughs> well, SBA lending, when I was underwriting, you had to put 20% down. Does that mean you had to put 20% down? Okay. Did you have to put any percent down? No. Okay. And that, there must the have way, been enough equity in the business then. Yeah. The, we had enough collateral yeah. to satisfy their, those requirements. Okay. Um, but Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the the bank is only on the hook for anywhere between 10 and 30% of that loan. And then it's the government backing up the rest. So, you know, not to get too too complicated, but yeah, there's, there, there's a definitely a sense of uh, fear that in a worst case scenario, here I had this successful business, but we grew it too fast or, you know, we ran, you know, we didn't manage our supply and demand or the cash flow and it could wipe out everything I've worked towards. Yeah. And the other thing I want people to listen to back home is I'm not excusing some of your emotional reactions, but what I am giving well, context to is yeah. the, 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 you're talking about 
a ton of severity. If this business fails and you are on the, the hook for a personal guarantee and you're a public figure, which they will make an example Absolutely. out of, you will be signing your Bravo checks over to those banks yeah. until it's paid for the rest of your life. And I don't like, know of another <laughs> that's the fact. beverage startup that has an SBA loan. So I'm in a world oh, all I've by myself. Seen that. Yeah. And it it definitely hits me sometimes. And I and so when you see me freak the frick out, just know that A, I'm not trying to make excuses. I'm actually completely embarrassed year over year over year about how I handle myself. Again, it's I'm actually finally in my own therapy working on my outbursts. Good for you. But um, there is financial therapy, by the way. <laughs> I, I, that might be a perfect thing up, for brother. you. <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, it, it, look, it, it and again. I am proud of, of how other people have leveraged this pl platform. I do envy my friends where they make a ton of money with a way less sophisticated <laughs> business plan. You know, so it's, look, I, I, the, high, the, the stakes are higher, right? With risk comes reward. Um, but it's pretty damn real when you have a $4 million loan in your name. It's no joke. Or I, you know, again, that's where maybe I got, I misled people thinking it's a personal loan. It's a $4 million loan that I've guaranteed. Yeah, that you've guaranteed, and it's backed by the government. It's typically loans, and we could talk more about the recap. It's typically loans that the bank wouldn't finance on their own because the risk might be too high. Exactly. So the government says, hey, bank, go give that loan out, and if it doesn't work out, we will pay you, right. bank, so you guys don't and this go said, belly and up. The one thing I'll make clear, like, this was not a, a COVID loan. This, no, 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 well, not you, even close. Yeah, but you'd, you'd be surprised. People, people like— have dug this up and and think that I try to be some like, you know, um, one of those businesses that took advantage Takes of- Takes the PPP yeah. and then runs. Exactly. And it's I know PPP some of those. Loan, they like, literally took millions of dollars and closed their doors. Yeah, it's terrible. It's ridiculous. Like that's not what it was there for. This has nothing to do with that. The SBA loan has been around, I don't know, you probably know better than me. It's probably been like 30, 40 years. It is as legitimate Minimum. as legitimate gets. You said it's easy to get approved. I think it's it's a much more harder loan to get approved because well, you have a, the paperwork is this big. Yeah, let me let me, let me me take that statement back. If you have like a motel, a cash flowing hotel- or like a, a golf course. a landscaping business where that you own a ton of like trucks and machinery. That those are easy assets to be collateralized yeah. by a bank, and so you can qualify. You know, so for anybody listening that's looking to buy a small business, don't think that you got to go if it's a million bucks, and there's actual real collateral and assets there, and it's cash flowing and this, this, and that. My God, go check out the SBA loans because yeah. you can fund that thing and only that. Those are probably instances where you do have to put money down when you when you are acquiring something. But we're talking, you know, 10, 20 percent. Correct. Fact and fiction. SBA loan very, very different than any type of COVID back loan. Everyone should know that it's extremely legitimate. A majority of the companies you see out there today that started from small business started from an SBA loan. So let's give that uh, a, a definite fact. Now, as we transition into facts, I do have a round of rapid fire for you because I'm. Just curious <laughs> about some of the true false narratives out there that connect business and pop culture. So let's do this. First one, Bravo. Are they connected at all to Loverboy? Do they get any type of dividends? You know, do they have any type of cahoots with you in the, the business side? They give you a lot of exposure. They talk about it often. What's it look like? No, they're not in cahoots. Technically speaking, they'll get a piece of um, you know, my takeaway if there is some type of acquisition and I'm still on air. Um, that's like what people call the Bethany Frankel clause, but by no means, I mean, I've seen people suggest that Bravo must own Loverboy because all the exposure they give me, it's, it, if anything, they tell me to tamper it down. They're like, Kyle, please take off the Loverboy shirt. And I'm like, what do you mean? That's, that's what I do. <laughs> I, I wear my merch. Like uh, my wife designed it. Hey, can you, can you put, you know, those drinks in cups? Yeah. You know? So if anything, they don't want it to look like an infomercial because- they don't want people thinking we are in cahoots. So it's quite frankly the opposite. They also could get brand opportunity for placement in which they would get paid and be in cahoots if this wasn't there. So, I mean, they're probably incentivized to not be in cahoots with you, quite frankly. Yes. Um, yeah, they, they, and they would never be in cahoots with one big brand because sure. then it rules out the opportunity for others to advertise. Right. So that's why you'll never see one particular of mass produce like alcohol just all over one show because alcohol is like arguably one of the biggest buyer of ads, ads on Bravo. Yeah, and they got huge dollars. Big all right, let's money. go to this. We're talking big Bravo. Now, 
individuals within your within your show, you know, ten thousand dollar, fifteen thousand dollar ads are are big, right? Do you force it upon your castmates? Do you put the lover boy in their hand? Do you make a suggestion everyone has to be drinking it? What does that look like? So, so in other words, true or false? Do I make my friends drink lover boy? <laughs> Essentially, yeah. Uh, no, false. Okay. So look, like like I said before, I never pushed this on anybody. Yeah, do I? Um, hope that they wouldn't bring my competitive products into the house? Sure. Keep in mind, we pay for all of our groceries, alcohol included. So oh, on the, the show you do. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Over the years, I actually just added this up because I saw this, I saw someone, or maybe it was because of the, this podcast, you know, debacle. I've, I've given the house about $100,000 worth of booze over the years. Mm. That's for us. That's for our friends. That's for parties. I'm sure the show doesn't pay for that. Not a dollar. I'm surprised by that. No. So early on, my friends were like, oh, sweet. We're no longer having to like use Splitwise or Venmo to cover the cost yeah. of alcohol. Um, now we just have to pay for our, our groceries. Um, now, if we go to a restaurant, they'll have like, you know, a $50 per head type sure, thing. Sure. Because that's them asking us to go to dinner or mm -hmm. whatever it might be. But, but no, I never force my friends to drink it. I always want my friends drinking it because uh, they want to reach for a lover boy. And then okay. you, you see it, like there's been plenty of times this season where I wasn't even in the house, people arrive and they grab a lover boy. Okay, there you go, there you hear it. Now I've read a comment out there, I think I know the answer to this one, but Amanda put up the money to pay the bills and start lover boy, true or false? False. I, I'm, I think there was just like a miscommunication between Amanda and Paige, because Paige kind of went on air saying, um, she not only was paying the bills when I was starting this, because I didn't have a source of income, but she also, put up her own cash for that initial um, pre friends and family mm -hmm. um, capital required right. to start the business. No, what she did do so graciously was put in her time to help me nail the branding. Um, I've always had multiple sources of income. I personally, like I said, funded that first hundred K while continuing to pay our bills, you know, and, uh, but I couldn't have done it without Amanda. Like she, she had such an impact. Her fingerprints are all over the original branding and, and are still today. So okay. another rumor, and we'll end with this one. There are rumors out there that you're actually a producer of the show and you provide <laughs> casting and story direction in the show and almost have like an EP title. True or false? No, I, I, I know there's still people that <laughs> think I got Hannah fired. It's actually quite the contrary. I, um, I told producers that I would film with her and I have zero input on casting. I helped cast season one. That's why I feel so proud of this show. I put in hundreds of hours making season one happen. Yeah. Cause there was a very good chance this was never going to happen period. So I cast season one. I literally everybody, but Steven, I helped bring in, I think Lindsay brought Steven, but I brought Lindsay and, um, but that's it. Like, sure, Winter House was built built on pictures of the, of, of what I called Stopalooza. Yeah. Like, that was a trip I was doing with friends. Yep. Similar to, like, Summer House, that was what we were already doing with friends. But, no, I have no uh, producer credit. Okay, so no <laughs> producer credit. I want to transition while well, I still got you to Love and Money. That's what my second book was about, Talk Money to Me. You've talked about Amanda. She was part-time. She was full-time. She scaled back. There's been some disruption with your relationship because of business. You've talked about it openly. This was a clip I was listening to, and this was oh this was when we podcast. It actually impacts both of us, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just play it and get your overall takes. It's two gotcha. years ago. Gift her a percentage exactly. of equity. Yeah. Got it. Any recommendations or advice for couples that work together, like professionally? Like literally for the like, same like company. You guys, or own, you guys will own equity together. Any right. thoughts or advice for people? I think that initially, man, is like, well, we got to draw a fine line. Like, like at night, at dinner, or in bed, no talking business. She quickly realized once we moved in that that's impossible for me. Me too. This is probably one of my biggest issues in our relationship. Yeah. She's like, turn it the fuck off. Yeah. Like, I'm like, I'm like, I can't that stop. switch does not exist. I can't. Yeah. Find the switch for me <laughs> right. and do it yourself because right. I can't. So I, I think that there's all sorts of like case studies in history of, of you know, it's not easy to like live with, date, and, and marry like an entrepreneur. Sure. Particularly if you're trying to build something, not just like a small business, but something that actually scales. Right. And you're dealing with 
investors and you're dealing with employees and employee, you know, like all the high stakes. You know, I think that. So that's what you said two years ago. It's wild how that literally manifested it to exactly what we talked about today. What's your overall take now? Like, is a healthy marriage possible? And by the way, at this time I was engaged. I told you I couldn't turn it off. I'm no longer engaged. So do I know. you think it's possible? Like, what's your overall take between mastering the business and trying to master your relationship? Or is it almost impossible? Look, like as painful as it was to, you know, I felt like I almost got like interrogated by Paige and Sierra when they were riding hard for Amanda, which I'm, like I said, I'm so glad she has like those types of friends. Um, I think I was really struggling to kind of cope. You know, last summer she'd already taken a step away. I don't think that was very clear to her friends, but um, she'd already taken a big step. And I, she's so good at what she does. I was so worried that her involvement would just continue to taper down to essentially nothing. And I, I feel like she's like Wonder Woman when it comes to branding, when it comes to merch, when it comes to our packaging, when it comes to our our brand voice and messaging. And, you know, look, I know I've criticized like her work ethic, but now that I better understand her, I know that's not what I should be focused on. And at the end of the day, like I want to support her. I want to make her happy. A lot of what drives me is this desire for financial freedom, independence, the ability to provide for a family. You know, there's been times over the years where my crazy work hours gets used against me either by Amanda or some of my friends. But like, I think what now I've realized is that I just need to be more in tune with, with like Amanda's needs. So if she needs to take a step back, I can't hold her and 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 like make her stay. Like, you know, and I think that that in a work, the thing about like when we have kids, she's not gonna have as much time to to focus on whatever she's focusing on, whether it's lover boy or her own ventures. Mm -hmm. And so I think I've just come to realize, okay, Kaya, you're an idiot. There's no steady state. Things change, things evolve, it ebbs and flows. Maybe she's completely not involved except at a super high level, or maybe like in six months, she's back to full time. Yeah. I just have to be more accepting and, and, and understanding of like what she needs and what's going to make her happy. It might be different from me. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is as a CEO, founder, and entrepreneur, you're going, I think, I'm observing that you're going through these hard lessons of when friendship and love meets business. Because you, as a hardworking, dedicated, committed person who puts literally what we talked about today, your entirety of your life on the line, you have expectations for others, for castmates, for good friends, and for even your wife that at times just aren't met. Right. And it's like at some point, I think it's almost like how as a leader do you almost find workarounds given right. that expectation I think I just need constantly to constantly not being met. Right. I think I right? need to be more compassionate and more, like look like I don't expect our castmates, my friends like Craig or even my wife Amanda to understand, you know, what it's like to walk in my shoes and I I I, I can't and when I try to explain, I almost like give off this like I'm, you know, better than you. Yeah. I'm running a more complex business. So I'm holier than you. You know, whatever it might be. And like, I really just got to work on my delivery and 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 just understand that like I need to, need to be more compassionate. That like they don't need to understand. Yeah, like it's it's not their problem. It's not their problem to understand, right? Or it's how do you implement things so that your problems then get solved, right? I think about like whether it's a podcast, whether it's the agency. Like I see competitors all the time doing things. I'm like, shit, like good get. You yeah. outdid me. I need I need to think better. I need to put contracts in place. Like yeah. I need to go get those people, right? Like what did I do wrong? And I think and I wish like the, I wish like my world was more like podcasting. Like podcast. If I if I started a podcast. You know, you'd come on, I'd come on your, like, you can kind of like build off of each other. Yeah. But in the agency, right? Like I, I want to sign the next person. Right. And then the person that I'm like, I literally, that owns the next agency and we're oh, friends agency, and we do yeah. deals and they cut me right at right. the legs. And yeah, that's a, that's a doggy it's dog. Doggy dog. Yeah. But I'm saying, I don't, my take is what I've learned because I've been so disappointed having expectations. Like I thought we had a handshake agreement. My handshake agreements are done. 
Yeah. And so what I've learned from getting burned left and right is I don't have expectations of other people. I think, how can I be a business, better business leader, yeah. right? How can I put a non-circumvent in place with someone that I worked with so they can't go work with Nike tomorrow if I got them that deal, right? right. I think about that and I feel like as, as personal relationships continue to come in to your business life and your expectations aren't being met, whether it's someone accepting a competitor deal or, or going somewhere else, I think there's things maybe that contractually you can put in place or strategies that can yeah. say, I don't have to worry about my expectations anymore. Yeah. I mean, look, like every industry is wildly different, totally. right? Yeah. Like here I was thinking about podcasting, we were talking about your agency, right? So, I mean, talk about like polar opposites in terms of yeah. how those ecosystems work. One is every podcast helps the next podcast. And the other is um, every man for himself. Yeah, literally. So <laughs> I think that's, again, a lot of people don't understand like, just there's, there's just so many nuances to every single industry, every single business. And I'm sure as heck not going to articulate that on a, on a Bravo show. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or, or get the edit that they're going to put yeah. together. Oh my God. Actually, that was one of the things that I was the most upset about. And I text the producers. I'm like, yo, when I blurted out that Loverboy is tanking, talk about, you know, something I regret. I was trying to make a point. Like, what I was trying to get at is like, it is stressful. Like we could go out of business at any moment. Like that's just the, 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 the high risk, high stakes situation I'm in as a, as a company that decided to expand nationwide. And, um, you know, obviously taking on its own, it's like, oh shoot. Yeah. Is Loverboy tanking? The, the irony is we filmed multiple scenes with my COO that went into detail about our financial position and why I was stressing out. None of that made the air. <laughs> the only thing that made the air was three seconds of a 30 minute download that I was giving to Amanda. So she's a little more informed because Amanda doesn't even know the intricacies of like our financial situation, right? And I, it dawned on me last summer, I'm like, I need to tell her. Yeah. So we, I went to great lengths to try to, help people understand none of that made the edit. Interesting. I get it. It's not a business show. Yeah, it's not a business show. They're not going to talk about But what that. makes the edit? Loverboy's tanking. Yeah. And, and that's like, the only thing people are stuck with. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, ah, oh, look, we, I'm really proud of what we built. We're a small company. Like we're doing a lot with a little. Yeah. And, um, you know, we've got a lot of momentum behind us. Uh, you know, I'm really proud that like, you know, we, we accomplished what we did having raised less than five mil. Um, I always, I always think about when I think about like, if I were to invest in a company, I'm like, you know, for every dollar you've, you've raised, how much can you generate from a revenue standpoint? Mm -hmm. Like that to me is one of the most, it's, it's the capital raise to revenue ratio. Yep. We're 10 to one. Wow. So for every dollar we've raised, we've generated $10 of revenue. So the business is far from tanking right now. Yeah. Look, like we have a lot going for ourselves, but we are still in that David versus Goliath sure. fight. So like every time someone's looking at the shelf, yeah. they see Loverboy versus some competitor that's a dollar cheaper or, you know, made with crappier ingredients, or they don't have Loverboy and they ask for it. Like it helps grab the Loverboy, ask for the Loverboy. Like otherwise you're just supporting some mass marketed conglomerate that cuts corners. How about this? Personally, so we've talked about some of the, the business uh, financials. Personally, you and Amanda, I mean, you're making six figures plus from the show. You're making, I assume, a shit ton from social media influencing. You have other streams of revenue. I'm sure I would imagine you're paying yourself some sort of salary, both of you two. Yeah, yeah. Like financially, when people are can, like thinking about your company taking in three lines or $3 million of deficit, financially, you two are off pretty good. Am I right or wrong? Well- it, you know, in that outlier, you know, instance where Loverboy were to go bankrupt because we've mismanaged something horribly, I mean, all that gets gone. That's taken true. Taken out by, by the SBA. It's true. Personal guarantee. So that aside, yeah, no, I'm not like stressing out about like keeping the lights on. Yeah. Um, but considering I've got, I'm five years into this. And we've gone through a pandemic. We've gone through supply chain challenges. Now, in the last two years, the number of products that come to market that I compete with has multiplied by maybe four or five fold. It is, it is fiercely competitive. And so I don't take anything for granted. 
I'm still working just as hard as I was when we first started. I love it. All right, let's see if we can end with this. You've mentioned the concerns with Craig. You've put it out there. You've recognized and taken some self-awareness, some of those things you would take back. Knowing what you know now, knowing where the company is, is Craig being aligned with a competitor behind you? Or is it still yeah, I mean, something to be honest, that you're holding on to? If I can be completely frank, like when it was announced on social, I already obviously knew it was coming. And uh, it was kind of out of sight and out of mind until Andy asked me about it. Because I, ha yeah. I haven't talked to Craig since. Okay. Um, I haven't talked to Craig since he more or less said it was it was too late. Would you be willing to talk to him now? Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, look, this all happened so fast. I've been, I've been traveling, you know, since the, since that Watch What Happens episode a week ago. Um, I'm about to travel some more. Uh, you know, due to the amount of like misleading and like incorrect things that were shared on said podcast. I would have loved to hear from him because I think the only thing that was true was that, yes, I bought Spurs Society. I buy all my competitors' products. How else yeah. do I make sure I'm, I'm making the best possible thing that we can make? Sure. Um, but aside from that, I was, I was a little heartbroken in terms of, um, you know, what was said and, and, and the inaccuracies, but it is what it is. So whether he reached out to me or I reached out to him, like, I'm, I'm sure we'll patch it up. Good. I hope you guys do patch it up. I think especially when you look at the business case, obviously, you know, it, it hurts. There's some emotion tied to it, but I, don't, I just don't, I don't see it moving numbers dramatically. But And I think there's processes, procedures you can put in place to make sure things like this don't happen again, right? Like, so. Yeah, I, or I just need to be more proactive. Like, if 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 Craig wanted an opportunity to invest, um, hey, let me know. Yeah. Or better yet. Or wait, wait, wait. I include You him. go get him. Yeah. <laughs> right? so, you go get him. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like, hey, maybe yeah. maybe um, uh, some of our, our, our newbie cast members, maybe I take the opportunity to get them involved yeah. earlier than later so they don't get tempted by some inferior, you yeah. know, like big conglomerate coming knocking on their door yeah. with a big paycheck. So I, I'm also there's ways weird. to handle it. Every industry is different. Every entrepreneur has their own thing. And I'm not saying at all what I'm doing is right some ways that I'm a little bit different. I actually like competitors. I want them to be my best friends. So like I have a competitor who's not even in the agency space, but they're, they're digital marketing company. So they're full service. I'm writing a check to invest in them. I'm going to sit on their board. Yeah. Like I, the competitors, the more information, the more I can be like be friendly with them. For, for no, I mean, industry. That's not, it's such a mind. big industry. I'm in so much the same, to go around. same like mindset. That's why I, took the dinner with Ben. Right, right. Good point. Okay. Right? Like, yeah, like yeah. The, I, 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 yeah. I was right there with you. Yeah. yeah. I just, again, I got taken by surprise. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm just still trying to, I'm just dealing it, dealing with it a little more publicly than I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Well, we're talking lover boy. We're talking summer house. We're talking your career, your, your, your personal life, anything else when it comes to the business, finance, or money side of those things that you want to make sure we address in the second State of the Union with Kyle Cook two years nah, later. I mean, look, I feel like we've heard a lot of ground. You know, I think um, for people listening that, that have that entrepreneurial itch, I think there's this huge emphasis on some kind of crazy risky business that requires venture capital and, you know, it's one in a million type thing. Look at businesses that can be funded by an SBA loan. Mm. Um, it might be harder to do beverage now than it was a couple of years ago, if I can be honest, because obviously lending guidelines change with the market. But look, you don't have to be working for somebody else and, and you don't need a million dollars to pull that off, to pull off your dream. And so, you know, I just encourage everybody to don't get, don't get um, misled to thinking that every wealthy entrepreneur started with some crazy venture back tech startup. No, like the wealthiest families in this country probably do something way less sexy than mm -hmm. you'd ever imagine. And their business today could have probably been funded with like an SBA loan. Yeah. And I think another good thing that people should think about, if you go to pursue an SBA loan and you get approved, that is a natural indicator that your industry, that your experience, that your management team, that historical financials 
are in a pretty good spot because yep. you're getting money cheap that the government is literally willing to stamp for approval saying we will back it up. Right. And so I also want to give you credit for locking up a $4.2 million SBA loan, which is nowhere near anything connected to type of COVID lending. Um, that is a huge testament to your financials, oh, to you. the management team, to everything, because those things don't get approved easily. And it's an indicator that you're in a good spot to repay that and to continue to do well. So well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate having you on two years from now. Hopefully we're talking exit. <laughs> we're not talking drama. And yeah, watch my what God. happens live. I'm, now I'm like, I'm ready to just wash my hands. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll do the third state Every of the union. Day. Every day is a new day. We appreciate you dressing the business, pop culture, finance, and money uh, discussions. And where can everyone find everything happening with love? Loverboy and yourself. Yeah, yeah. So Loverboy, drinkloverboy.com, at drinkloverboy on socials. I'm Kyle Cook is my handle, literally, like the letters I am. <laughs> I don't know why I chose that back in the day. But uh, yeah, thanks everybody for the support. Awesome. Cheers. Thanks for being on. Cheers, man.